welcome to the second episode of GOSH, produced by Beyond Being Human. And today my guest is Dr. John Weber, a psychiatrist from Melbourne. He's been in practice for over 30 years. And until about 10 years ago, he was uh, entirely convinced that consciousness was limited to the brain. But subsequent events have altered that, which is what we're here to discuss today. Welcome, John. Thanks, Kim. Thanks for uh, thanks for inviting me. And yes, I've been uh, I've been practicing now for uh, thirty three years, something like that. So uh, it's been a while, and and still practicing. But it was about ten or twelve years ago that up until then I had been a very traditional uh, doctor, a psychiatrist attached to traditional science and medicine, and anything to do with spiritual things psychic things, metaphysical things, I was completely dismissive of. I just thought it was baloney, so I wasn't prepared to listen. And I've discovered that nothing's coincidence, Kim. My daughter came to me with a uh, with a book and uh, and said, Dad, you've got to, I want you to read this. Now, it was lucky because normally I just wouldn't read it. And it was a book by Brian Weiss, uh, Many Lives, Many Masters. I was about to go on holidays. So I said, okay, I'll uh, I'll read the book. And I read it. And it was remarkable. It had a very big impact on me. Obviously, I was ready for the information. It had a very big impact. He was a traditional psychiatrist who was the the chairman of the Department of Psychiatry at Miami University, attached to the Mount Sinai Universities. So very traditional. He had a very difficult patient who wasn't getting better. She had all sorts of physical problems and psychological problems. And he did hypnosis on her, hoping that it might go back to some trauma in her earlier childhood. And the second time he did it, he said, go back to when your problems began. And remarkably, she went back to a uh, a lifetime of many centuries ago. I think it was a very traumatic one where she ended up being, uh, her throat being cut or something like that. Reading the book was lovely because he, he went through all the machinations of is this, you know, schizophrenia? Is it some other illness? Is there something going on here? But in the end, what was remarkable was that she was just getting better and, and going into these other lives, not just that first one, as he continued to do the hypnosis. So it was a, it was a lovely, and I'm sure a lot of the viewers have, uh, have read that book because it, uh, it was very impactful for me. So I did more, more reading more of Brian's work, more of his books, Michael Newton's book, things like that to do with, with past life regressions and reincarnation. And around the same time, another thing happened. My son-in-law came to me and said, oh, look, something remarkable happened. He had always been very sad about the death of his brother, which was about 12, 18 months earlier. And he was still still grieving that, and he was concerned because he had his older brother's car. His brother had um, had left him in the car in his will, and he just didn't know what to do with it. The car was a wreck. He couldn't repair it, but it had great sentimental value, and so he didn't want to let it go. And his mother, who was really quite spiritual, said, look, why don't you go and see this medium, uh, Monica? Apparently she's terrific. And Sam, who normally just wouldn't do something like that, he was a you know, in his 30s and, uh, and again, like I was at that age, dismissive of all that stuff. I think younger people are more open to it now, I have to say. But he did to please his mum. He rang up anonymously and made an appointment when saw Monica. She said, look, what they do in these situations is they provide you with evidence to show that they're there, that this is real. And she then started to describe the, the brother's personality, Christian, and it was pretty accurate because he was, he was a tricky tricky character at times and then after about 10 minutes and I listened to the audio so I made sure you know that that it was real it was all taped and then after about 10 minutes she said he's saying don't worry about the car get rid of the car Um, it doesn't matter which was just quite remarkable and then another 10 minutes later she said and now he's laughing and saying Tim or Timmy, does that make any sense to you? And Sam said, well, when he was a younger boy, he, the older brother and Christian used to tease him and call him little Timmy. So it made complete sense. So those two incidents really had a very big impact on me, reading Brian's book and and Sam's experience. So I did. I read more Brian's work 
and the work of Ian Stevenson, Virginia University, who was a child psychiatrist who explored over his career, I think some 3,000 children who talked about their past lives. And in his case, it was about, I think there was something like 200 of those children he was actually able to verify the past life that the child had talked about. So it was quite remarkable work. And when you read about this, you know, again, you just wouldn't, I wouldn't normally have read any of these things. So for me, it was just quite remarkable. And then I read up about near-death experiences and lots of lovely books, Bruce Grayson and, and Jeffrey Long and, and others like that, and individual accounts of near-death experiences. Then read up on, um, on mediums, Laura Lynn Jackson and uh, and John Edwards, and more recently, Tyler Henry. And that, again, had a, I would have been totally dismissive, but I went, whoa, there's stuff here that just can't be ignored. And then read up about psychic stuff, you know, so Dean Radin's work at Virginia University, um, Nodic Sciences, and all the evidence related to psychic phenomenon, telekinesis, telepathy, remote viewing, precognition, all of those kind of things. And, and in the end, the evidence was just, it was, for me, it was just outstanding. So I was, I was a convert. I was, I was prepared to look at all of these things. And being a psychiatrist, I then looked to the possibility of, of doing some, um, some work using hypnosis with some of the patients. And that's really where the, the books around that, that, um, that topic and, and one patient in particular that I, I saw over time who'd been so difficult and really was just lucky to be alive. So, so that's what got me going. That's the way I needed to, to read up on the evidence to be, to be sure, but in the end it's all there. So, that, That's really a remarkable thing, isn't it, John, that you were prepared to look at the evidence because medical mainstream medicine won't look at the evidence, I find, because they don't believe it's possible, so they won't actually look at all the research. There's an, an odd arrogance attached to it. And, and to be fair, we've done, you know, if you look at science over the last 100 years, we've done some remarkable things in flying and going into space and, and even within medicine, antibiotics and, and microsurgery and, and all sorts of things that have, have been really quite remarkable. So, so we're very attached to, to how much we've done in the last 100 years. But that, I think, has created an arrogance. And so if we can't explain it, then it doesn't exist. And, of course, good science is, is quite the reverse. Good science is, you know, the fact that we can't explain it is we can't explain it, but that doesn't mean it's not real. And, of course, there are layers to that, Kim, you know, in terms of research. You don't get funding if you're going down a path of, uh, of spiritual or psychic stuff in most cases. so. But again, I think the world is opening up. It's lovely to see that. And I think there's more open-mindedness regarding all of those topics now. I think you're absolutely right. The world is slowly opening up. And you, I know from a previous talk that I heard you give at the Theosophical Society, did something that I thought was quite courageous. And that is you actually talked about your book, The Red Chair, and the events leading to it, to your peers. My first, first talk was to the Theosophical Society, which was lovely. And a huge number of people came. They just didn't expect it. It was kind of like that here's a psychiatrist talking about, you know, psychic phenomenon and reincarnation. It's like, whoa. So that was lovely. And one of the members of the society happened to be the wife of uh, one of the psychiatrists at the local hospital. And, and she said, oh, what's this John Weber doing uh, writing a book on this stuff? And uh, he said, oh, okay, well, we're going to have to get him to come in and give a talk on it. So I gave a talk to the, um, to the professorial forum at the uh, local hospital. And I was, I have to say, I was, I was really delighted. I was pretty nervous because I thought, oh, I'm going to get slammed coming up with all of this stuff. But I was able to discuss the difficulties with the patient that was particularly talked about in the book and, and how hard it had been and how lucky she was to be alive, really, and how traditional psychiatry really had failed in making any impact on her. She'd been in and out of hospital. She'd had ECT shock treatment. She'd had medications. So they were remarkably receptive. It was really lucky. And the professor at the end of the talk 
said, uh, he said, oh, look, I'm going to have to think a bit more about these kind of things. One of the other psychiatrists got up at the end of the talk. He said, well, we're scientists, and as scientists, we should keep an open mind that we can't explain it doesn't mean it doesn't exist. And he went on to describe a patient who'd had a near-death experience. And this is a really funny story. It's peculiar, but it's, it's good fun. And that patient had had a, a head injury and so had a, what's called an extradural hemorrhage where you get a blow on the brain and then there's a bleed onto the surface of the brain. And it's very dangerous. It's life-threatening. So it requires emergency surgery. So this patient had to go in for the, for the surgery. And while he was in having his brain operated on and the blood removed, so his eyes would have been taped, he would have had gowns everywhere, and he floated out of his body and, and looked back down. He could see the surgeon, see the nurses, see his body on the, on the table. And he said at one stage towards the end, he saw um, the surgeon pinch the nurse's bottom, um, which is outrageous. And I know we're not there. <laughs> I presume the surgeon at that stage didn't need to keep his sterility. But um, it was remarkable. And so when he, and he made a full recovery, and this is the psychiatrist telling the story, so it's lovely. He made a full recovery. And when he finally got the surgeon to one side, he said to the surgeon what, he, what he'd experienced floating out of his body and then seeing what the surgeon did. And the surgeon went bright red and confirmed what he'd seen. For me, what happened then was this other psychiatrist was then describing a veridical near-death experience, literally a near-death experience that, that cannot be explained in any kind of, with, with regard to brain being the source of consciousness. It just, it's just not possible. So for me, that was ambrosia. I, uh, it was just a lovely way of, uh, of finishing the talk. And, of course, after the talk, there were lots of people who came and contacted me and said, oh, it's lovely that somebody else is thinking outside the square. And, and in the end, of course, that's the reason I wrote the book. I just I like the idea of, of people being exposed to, if someone reads the book, just one person like I read Brian's book, and it opens them up to the possibilities, then for me, that's a success. I totally understand that, having written a few books myself now. And I've read them. They're lovely. Thank you. <laughs> yes, a bit shocking, but yes, I, I would never have thought I'd be giving them to a psychiatrist 20 years ago either, I must say. Exactly. I've been doing a lot of things that I would not normally be expecting at all. And look, the lovely thing about this is too, once you once you become more open to this, you can mention it to your patients. And of course, I'm, I'm very careful. You know, I'm still working, so I have to do things in a, in a traditional way. Once your patients know, and others know that you're open to these ideas, you start hearing their experiences and they're quite remarkable. They're lovely. So I've got lots of them. And, and obviously, I've had more of those since I, uh, since I wrote the book. So there's a lot that's been happening in my life that I wouldn't have expected 12 years ago, that's for sure. Wonderful things, though. And, that, I mean, that's what GOSH is about. It's giving people that safe space. And I started the first GOSH group just locally, and it's, it's just a little town, Ben Stale, and I didn't expect much. But it was surprising to me how many people came forward with just one even extraordinary story that, had, that they'd needed to talk about, that they couldn't talk about. So it's really that stigma of being isolated if you do talk about it. And, removing that's wonderful for people isn't it just lovely and and that's look one of the problems is that now there's a lot of people wanting to to come and see me or 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 talk to me and and I'm I'm just running out of time so unfortunately I can't see them all and, and talk to them and of course there are some patients I remember talking to Brian I had I had lunch with Brian uh, when he came out here last time and Brian Weiss and and he said you know he had a, a waiting list of 7,000 he had to put an end, you know, he had to stop because he said that wasn't fair. Because he said one of the problems is once you do the regressions, people want to still come and see you. They love talking about it. They love talking about their experience. They love reinforcing it and, and consolidating it. And it's completely understandable. There's lots of lovely, lovely opportunities that are arising as a result of this. I'm not surprised. I would think, it, yes, it will just keep expanding, won't it? You will have to draw a line and close your books eventually. I've had to, my family have spoken to me and said, Dad, come on, and I've had, had a look at it all and I said, okay, I'll, I'll set limits on it. So, yeah, but it's good fun. And speaking of your family, how has that been? How did your family? My wife 
once she read it too and she's engaged in it, her upbringing was a little bit more, I went to Sunday school and that was about it. So, uh, you know, that was the end of it for me. But she went through her teen years still going to, to church and she'd always felt a drawn to it but it just didn't make sense to her it didn't um, it just didn't fulfill her idea of what was what was going on the idea that you could be sent to hell and all of those kind of those things it just didn't fit and once she read these things and and other she loves law of attraction which i think has absolute merit and and stuff like she was right into it so i'm lucky i've, I've been completely supported by her and and I've got four children and I would I would argue at least two of them are, are very open to it as well. But the others are not dismissive. You know, they're, they're open-minded. And my brother, he was fantastic. My brother and, and sister-in-law, he had friends who were interested. So all of a sudden he's giving me books to read. I think he gave me um, the book on uh, Old Souls, you know, the Ian Stevenson book, which was which was terrific, where a, a journalist followed Ian Stevenson on his work and it was it was really quite compelling. I I loved it. So so my brother's also been been lovely. Yeah. And and one of my sisters. So <laughs> so it's been good fun. So I've been very lucky in that sense, Kim. You don't you don't normally and I've got patients who come to see me almost, I think, because I'm the only person they can talk to about these things. Which is which is sad because it's it's really fun to explore. It. So really good fun. It is. It is really fun. And sometimes I think Gosh is a bit likened to AI in a way, where you can just all get together and talk about one experience that you all know so well, even though you know, very no, exactly, and and feel like you're not alone. And it does. It it just legitimizes things, and it, it's really it's really quite lovely, and it reinforces it. And I think a lot of the spiritual stuff, because we're still here on earth and it's hard work. It's really hard work. You know, there's, it's not easy at all. So it's easy to get dejected or to, to lose perspective on some of the lovely spiritual lessons that are, that are there for us, that, that come out of the regressions, that come out of our experiences, our psychic experiences and, and all of that. So it really is, it's nice to have those things reinforced. I, I now journal. So as soon as I get a patient who tells me a story that's that's really interesting, I'll tend to uh, I'll tend to journal it. I mean, my wife talking of my family. I meant to to say my wife three years ago now, um, and again this is after I'd, I'd written the book. She had an experience where she was away with her friends and was and on a patchwork weekend for uh, which they do annually. And she woke up at six o'clock in the morning. Her parents lived in Geelong, about 80 kilometres away, and they were reasonably well. They're in the early 80s. But she woke up at 6 a.m. in the morning, which is unlike her, and all of a sudden she felt like there was someone next to her on the bed, and it said to her, I have to leave you now. And she thought, oh, well, I don't think John's leaving me. And I wasn't. I'm very, very happy in my marriage. But it was quite profound for her. She couldn't get back to sleep. And then about 20 minutes later, her mother rang to say that her father had just died. He'd had a, a coughing fit and he'd ruptured a, an artery and, uh, and had bled to death. So, so really quite, quite tragic in its own way. But for her, there was just no question. That was her father saying goodbye. And remarkably, the same night, her father's granddaughter had a a dream where the grandfather had died. So there are two occasions on the same night where he'd said goodbye. I've got no doubt that was him saying goodbye. He's a very interesting man because he'd had 50 years earlier, he'd had a near-death experience. He had a very bad car accident in Scotland. And, and I wrote briefly about that in the book, he ruptured his aortic arch, which is very nasty and, and, and would be fatal. So he had to go into surgery, and while he was in surgery, he floated out of his body. And these were his words to me. He said, John, it was the most lovely experience. He said there was just a feeling of no judgment, and he could move either way just by thinking about it. And he was looking back down on his body and the surgeons and the nurses working on his body. And in the end, that was 50 years earlier, so he made a remarkable recovery. Mm -hmm. He was actually written up in The Lancet because he was the only second man ever to have had Dacron used to replace the aortic arch. But no mention of the near-death experience, Kim. 
<laughs> no, unfortunately. <laughs> After that, he was never scared of, of death. He knew it was fine. He was just completely comfortable with that. And, of course, when he told me that experience, I was probably in my 30s then, and, of course, I just dismissed it. I just went, oh, yeah, no, there must have been some little part of your brain still working that, that created that experience. So that's what we do, but I, I know better now. How have your views around death and dying altered due to the experiences you've been having? I'm very comfortable with the idea that there's life after death and that, that that's, it's lovely. There might be a bit of a period of transition. I don't know. It's very easy for us to apply our human logic to these things, and I, I think we've got to be careful with that. I've just got no doubt that we have had past lives and probably future lives, that there is a spirit world that we go to, that our true consciousness, our soul, our spirit, whatever you want to call it, leaves our body after death and goes into this spirit state and joins up with our soul groups or in, in that spirit realm. I'm not in a hurry to die because um, I'm having fun down here. It's good. It's great. But no, I'm very comfortable with the idea of death and that things will, will go well. I mean, that's one of the things when you do past life regressions, not all the patients, but a number of them will go into a past life. Then they'll go through the past life um, to the end, right to their death, and then they'll describe leaving their body literally leaving their body behind and and describe how lovely that feeling is and the relief of having left that 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 bag of bones and um and then in a lot of cases then get in touch with other souls people that they may have lived with in that lifetime or other guides and uh, and in that spirit state so and it's invariably very lovely very calm very peaceful and just very loving for those patients, it's also really lovely. It gives them a much bigger perspective on what life's about and the idea that we don't have to get it all right in this lifetime. You know, um, there's there's plenty of lives and there's there's stuff we do in that spirit state as well. So um, it's yeah. So I'm 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 very comfortable with the idea that there's life after death and that it's good. I don't think there's a hell. Yeah. I think um, I think it's all I think it's all good. So yeah. Yes, yeah, so I have. Difficulty with people who have had uh, experiences of hell in that in that situation of near death, and I wonder to a certain degree how much whatever we experience might be to do with our beliefs about what we expect to happen. That's my wife's comment. She says, "I think we probably experience initially what we expect. So if we've had a very hard, you know, Catholic upbringing, and you know, it's going to be, you know, fire and brimstone and." and all of that, then we often get shown initially after we die something that's along the lines of what we expect. But I think we almost, in well, my sense is that we transition from that and go into something it's quite lovely. There is a small percentage of when you look at all the, the near-death experience work and, and what's written, there clearly is a small percentage that have had a negative experience. They describe it as, as a difficult thing and quite distressing but I, that's my hunch is that that's they get shown that initially because that's what they expect but then it moves on to something else that that's that's my best guess but again i'm i'm very careful about not trying to define things too much so yes me too because i don't want to limit myself and my experience of all of that yes mm. In fact, Evan Alexander and um, was it Proof of Life? I think his book was called. Yeah, Proof he, of Heaven. Yeah, Proof, Proof of, of Heaven. Evan Alexander. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. He he had what could have started off as fairly unpleasant. His That's experience. right. That's mm. right. Yeah. But I think he actually asked for help, didn't he, or something like how to get out of here, or yeah, something along those lines. He was going through these layers of of very difficult emotions, and or and then finally he mer he emerged from it and felt wonderful and again the near-death experiences can be quite different it can be a, a tunnel it can just be a glorious light and a feeling of love an indescribable feeling of love in some cases they they do a, a full past life review or a, or a life review when you and you'd think well there's no time to do that they're only you know only out of it for, for four minutes their time is an illusion 
I mean, that's the truth of it. So the, the near-death experiences vary a lot. Mostly they're lovely. Mostly they're lovely and they, they're very calming and, and loving and like my fa father-in-law, um, a sense of no judgment. But I, I, my hunch is we too sometimes see what we expect. Just to, to go back to that, those patients who do the past life regressions, their descriptions of death and leaving their body are often very similar. Have you ever had anybody speaking another language? When they're... Oh, no, that's a really good question. And, and the answer is no. <laughs> I'm super frustrated by that. I always remember Brian's story of, of him seeing the, the Chinese surgeon. She was desperate to see him, so she flew over to America. And, uh, and while she was there, she went back in. And, and hypnotising her with a translator, I have to say, was very, very gutsy by Brian, but it, clearly it was successful. She went back into a life, an English life, and then during that past life, she started speaking English. And the translator, it's hilarious because the translator then started translating it back into Chinese. So, you know, that's just, for me, that's just hilarious. The woman had no English. Intelligent, yes, but, but had no English. So just remarkable. Ian Stevenson, a couple of his children spoke dialects or languages that they, they didn't know. And he was able to show that the dialect was the same or the language fitted the life that they had talked about and the family just didn't understand the child when it was speaking i've been a bit bummed by that i haven't i, I haven't had anyone famous yet kim no one famous yet in my past life regressions and i haven't had a xenoglossia this speaks to the fact that there is more open-mindedness so i spoke to a boris he's doing a master's in psychology over in Perth, lovely man. He's doing it on past life regressions, the therapeutic benefits. Now, this is a master's at university. He's got ethics approval for that, which is just wonderful. He said he it was a, a, a client who had very little education, left school after year 10 or year 9. He said his geographical and language knowledge would have been primary school level. So he wasn't a well-educated man. And he started speaking a language that he just couldn't understand. This is during a past life regression. So he taped it and he took it to a professor and the professor said, oh, that's that's a, almost certainly a very ancient language, maybe Egyptian, Mesopotamian, something like that. And then when Boris said, look, you know, this happened, this person spoke this during a, um, uh, a past life regression, unfortunately, the professor said, well, I won't be able to present that to anyone. <laughs> which is very, very disappointing. And I've listened to the tape. Boris sent me a, a copy of it. The speech is very slow and deliberate, and it's, it does sound very primitive, certainly not a language I've, I've had any exposure to. And at the end of the session, the, the client said, oh, no, I was reading that from a stone tablet. So I'm bummed. I haven't, um, I haven't had a xenoglossia yet. I'm looking forward to it. I had a GP, she's long dead now, but she did hypnosis as part of her general practice every okay. now and then yeah, for anxiety and depression. Yes, yeah. She was in New Zealand when this happened and she did have somebody who started speaking French and her whole mood changed, yeah, and she did not know French. It was just, you know. No, it didn't make any sense. Yes, I've had a friend who uh, was post-surgery in, uh, in the uh, recovery room and a young man came in post his surgery and he was talking fluent French. She didn't know that, but she, that one of the nurses knew French and she said, oh, no, that's he's speaking French. And, of course, when he'd made a full recovery from his uh, anaesthetic, he had no idea what, um, what he'd said and didn't speak any French. So, <laughs> Amazing world, isn't it? That's the whole idea of, of hypnosis, I think, is that we shut the brain down. You go into a trance, so you're sort of switching off all the other components of the brain that interfere all of our left brain stuff that's that's constantly interfering with our thinking and by slowing it down and and reducing it we're able to tap into memories tap into knowledge or consciousness that goes beyond the brain if you were to ask me what my simple thoughts were it would be that i think consciousness pre-exists matter if you look at all of the evidence like regarding psychic phenomenon and, and near-death experiences and mediums and past life, even if only one of those things was true, then you can't say that, that consciousness is limited to the brain. You, you just can't. Once you've got one right crow. You... That's it. 
Yep, exactly. I was wondering, another one that cropped up while you were talking is, any ETs, extraterrestrials, ever happen? In- oh, that- <laughs> and I know you're curious about that because I've read your second book and it's lovely. I have little doubt that there are other universes or, you know, galaxies beyond ours where that's, um, that's the case. Judy, who's the main character in, in the book, she would go into a past life and then would die in that past life and then go into a spirit state. She had a guide that she called Goldie who would come and, and connect with her and, and explain things. It was quite remarkable. He'd start telling her how to manage things in the future and start telling what might happen in the future, which proved to be correct. Even on one occasion said, tell John not to worry about his shoulder, it'll be okay. And as it happened, I did have a sore shoulder that I'd had for months and it was annoying me. Um, And she had no idea of it, of course. And it was like, whoa, okay. So things like that became the evidence for me. But yes, he or that guide or someone in that spirit state would take her to see, and I can't remember what she called them, Gumbies or something like that. She said they look like Gumbies, but would take her to another planet and show her these other beings and she said it was lovely. She said they were they were good fun, they were good natured, but she was being shown those aliens, those other life forms, to broaden her perspective on life and the universe. That's my one experience of extraterrestrials. Yep. Well, it's, a, it's a lovely one though, isn't it? Being shown Exactly. And given what she had described and the evidence that she came up with when I was doing the past life regressions and when she was in that spirit state, I have no doubt what she was describing was real. This is actually a question from somebody else who's been involved with drug addicts for a long time. Yeah. Has come across a couple of addicts that have mentioned that they've had past life regressions and that it helped. Do you ever use it as a tool for treating addiction? I haven't specifically. Almost by default, it's had that benefit. Not specifically for drug addiction. No, I haven't. Not certainly not past life stuff. I've um, I've used hypnosis for for people who've got heroin issues, and I used that on Judy, who was in the book, and that was really helpful. But that was a more straightforward hypnosis. I've done it with a couple of other patients, which has been really helpful. But no, I actually haven't done a past life regression to see if that. But it makes sense, and it has. I've certainly had patients who've reduced their drinking, reduced their cigarette smoking, simply because they feel better. Their life is given more perspective. They're able to to see themselves in the world differently, and their addictions and their, I suppose, defences aren't required in the same way. Really good question. Mm. I've had different patients. It's interesting to contemplate who it's going to help and when it's appropriate. I've been very cautious. I, I don't use it with patients with schizophrenia. I just that's I've used it on one or two patients with bipolar, and that but they have to be stable. I'm not prepared to do it if they're not really quite stable. But that's actually been really helpful for, for some of them, for, for those those couple that I've done it for. Most of the patients I've done it for, anxiety, depression, life stress, you know, all of that kind of thing. And, and in those cases, it's been very, very helpful. Not always the cure. It's not the panacea. But for some people, it's really helpful and makes a, makes a very big difference. But even just talking about these things as we are today, Kim, makes a big difference you know I've got one patient who is a doctor his mother was dying over in England and he did a bit of reading after we chatted and and he became very sure that that there was life after death this was during COVID unfortunately so he couldn't go over to see her in England and, and they knew she was dying she was really unwell so he talked to her most nights on the phone and he said okay mum what do you want for your funeral you know they discussed that and they, she said, oh, look, I want this, that, and the other thing. And she said, my last song I want when they're taking my body out, I want it to be Life is a Cabaret. So she wanted that to be the last song. And he said, fine. And he said, look, Mum, by the way, I'm pretty sure there's life after death. So when you get to the other side, I want you to make sure that you let me know that you're okay. And she said, no worries, Tim, I'll do that. And Tim, who's, you know, he's, he's a lovely guy. 
And he, I saw him probably about two months after his mum's death or three months, and he said he had been driving in his car about two months after the funeral and he'd been listening to the ABC, so people chatting away, talking away, and he said all of a sudden for absolutely no reason, he said, John, I promise you, I did not touch anything. The station, the radio station flipped onto a station that was playing Life is a Cabaret by Liza Minnelli. Beautiful. That is just not coincidence. Yeah, and I've got lots of stories like that's the lovely thing about writing the book. People do start telling you these things. Yeah, I'll tell you one now. I was driving, we were moving house and I was driving from Warrnambool to up to Bairnsdale and I was on my own because we were all in convoy with things packed in cars and I suddenly realised it was my long dead mother's birthday. It was 28th March and I... I had the radio going and I turned the radio down and I, at the top of my lungs, because I was all alone and wouldn't be annoying anyone, sang happy birthday to her. And when I'd finished, I turned the radio back up just in time for the announcer to say, and I've got to say it was louder than he'd been speaking before. But anyway, he said, just stay mum about that. (laughs) (laughs) Well, wow, that's beautiful. (laughs) Oh, no, it's gorgeous. And you do have to sit back and just go, No, nothing's coincidence. Even simple things like I'll think about a patient that I haven't thought about for eight years. And on these days now, I'll guarantee that I'll get called by the patient or contacted within the week, and I almost invariably do. And you go, yep, no, there's a telepathy, a consciousness that's connected that we can't explore. Well, I think it filters through everything. Yes. It holds everything. I wouldn't say that the desk has consciousness, but I would say perhaps the Consciousness has the desk. Really hard when you're when you're here with all of the the material elements in our our life. It is hard to keep that perspective, but if we keep an open mind to it, I think it's just lovely. I think that's why my my wife likes law of attraction. It's just that idea that if, if you can maintain a sense of appreciation with life, then we're just much more likely to attract things that are that are good. And I think there's real truth in that. Yes, I do too. Yeah, I do. Some people get their connections in dreams, of course. I saw a patient a year and a half ago and I said, I'm I'm curious about people if they've had any psychic or spiritual experiences. And she said, well, if I do have it, it's it's always in my dreams. And she said, I just not long ago, I had a dream where my best friend's mother had died. She woke up out of the dream and said, well, that doesn't make sense. I know my best friend's mum is completely fine. And of course, that next day, She found out that the mother had died suddenly and and tragically and a week later she was at the funeral. She dreamt of being at the funeral. That was the main essence of that. But other people will get it in dreams as well. Most of our dreams are to do with our ongoing current stuff. (laughs) Sometimes they have more to it than that. So I had another patient who's had a very difficult son with schizophrenia and the son had come around the previous night in the evening and demanded money for them he was really unwell and and they were very sad they wouldn't give him any money so they he got quite violent ended up pushing them both on the ground and stealing their mobile phones and they were really distressed and they didn't know quite what to do but they thought look even for the son's sake they had to go to the police and report it so that that could be chased up so they spent the evening writing down the events to the police and it was a very distressing evening And the very next morning, Tim, his friend who he does Pilates with, who never rings him, rang him that morning and said, hey, mate, are you okay? I had a dream last night where you were having a terrible time and I don't know why I had that dream, uh, but I just had to ring you to make sure that everything's okay. And, of course, I've no doubt there was a a conscious connection. So, Yeah. In fact, I I actually run a dream every, every two weeks, so I think dreams are the most underestimated sort of area of uh, precognition, that sort of connection. The number of people you who will have, for instance, as you just talked about, somebody who died come to them in a dream. Mm. Then they wake up and they go, oh, but it was just a dream. And, and I'm just like, no, you're in a different brainwave state. It's a visit. It's a conscious visit. Like, yeah. But we dismiss it and it's so sad that we do that because most people have interesting dreams, don't they? And even children, when they're with their past life stuff, it's often first comes to them in dreams. They'll have night terrors of the uh, the distress that they suffered when they died in the previous life. Mm-hmm. There's that. Uh, I remember Soul Survivor James Leninger. His parents wrote a book 
about, and he's since been on Netflix and, and other things. They're a remarkable story, but he would have night terrors when he was in his, you know, two and a half of, of being in the plane and plummeting, you know, into the sea. And he would draw pictures of the plane and, and things like that. And then he started saying what the plane was and all of the details. It's actually a really interesting read. But again, things that just can't be explained. And so I, I, I agree with you. I think dreams can be a, a source of information that we tend to dismiss. If you do a lot of it, it's worth doing a dream journal, I think, just, oh, yeah. to, just to contemplate that sort of thing. Definitely a dream journal. Psychiatrists love dreams because they uh, they often do represent a little bit of the uh, the background stuff as well. So I'm always curious if people have dreams because it's it can represent a bit of their subconscious conflict that's going on as well, as well as other psychic stuff. The whole thing is such a fertile ground, isn't it? The dream one. Exactly. Yeah, I actually dreamt with my eldest daughter two weeks before she became pregnant. I, I knew she would because my mother came to me in a dream with a baby and said, I've got a baby for for you, Anna. You knew it was going to happen, yep. And that baby was exceedingly anxious. And I'm bringing this up because of what you've just said. He was so anxious in this dream. And I said, well, I'll be here for as long as I can for you if you come. (laughs) Which is good because he suffers night terrors. Mm. Which are distressing and Mm. uh, and distressing for the parents as well. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And whether that's related to a past life, Maybe, maybe not, but it's it doesn't surprise me when I hear about those kind of stories. When Ian Stevenson did his work on children, invariably it was children were remembering a life where they died, it was traumatic, and he said there would be a yearning to go back to fix whatever was going on. Jenny Cookell wrote a book called Yesterday's Children, and it's a lovely account of, of her dreams and her memories of that past life and the desire to go back because she was a effectively a single mother who had I think five or six children that she was desperately trying to look after but then she died from cancer and in the end she went back as an adult and found the family which is absolutely remarkable who were of course older than her yeah but they incredibly they accepted her because she was able to recount events that could not possibly have been explained that the family knew about yeah he'd say there was often a yearning in the children to go back and fix what had happened and fix the trauma. And he would describe some of the children having birthmarks and the birthmarks often represented the cause, the, the trauma that caused their death. I mean, the one I always remember was one child had a, an area of depigmentation of white skin, a, a darker skin child had white skin in the chest about the size of a 20 cent piece or 50 cent piece. And when he went back and confirmed the life of that child, and the child had no idea what that, or the family had no idea what was the cause of that. He discovered that that, that previous life, the person had died from an accidental gunshot wound to the chest. Mm. And again, how do we explain that? I don't know. How does the, the conscious awareness of that gunshot then transpose into this life? That, that's, that I can explain, but it's okay. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so much there still you don't know in there. It's, there is so much to explore. Again, I think it's important not to try and explain it too much, uh, not to try and understand it, but just be aware of it. And to remember to say, I think the thing that we always hate saying in our society is, I don't know, but, yeah. I don't know, but, exactly. Or, no, I can't explain that, but that's okay. Let's explore it. Let's see where it goes. So they are still doing lots of good work in parapsychology. But again, the evidence, once you get into it, the evidence is is really overwhelming. It's it's like, please. But it's great that it's being done because, again, that will continue to open people's minds. And even when you go to quantum physics, I mean, there's there's enormous amount now in quantum physics, which is essentially traditional science. You know, the Einstein proved it over 100 years ago that time is not linear, that time can stop. And we, we know that. It's just remarkable that we hold on to all the Newtonian physics and the materialism of the old science. But it's changing, Kim, I, I, and I love that. That really thrills me that you say that, that it's changing, yeah. I mean, you're an example of that to me, so that's why I love your story. 
I'm sure I've come into this life wanting to be exposed to it and wanting to learn in this lifetime. And, and of course, it wasn't until 12 years ago, but, yeah. but, now, but now it is. And that's okay. I'm happy to do that. So I'll be yeah. curious to know what my next life will be. Even then it gets complicated because you start talking about lifetime and you, if you think about time being an illusion, then probably all the lifetimes are happening at the same time. So is it linear? Is it? Who knows? Because we were going to talk about reincarnation, I was, I was cleaning out my bookshelf because we're moving and, of course, I'm doing a lot of reading at the time, same time, and I came across this amazing story of reincarnation from Thailand where, in essence, the chap was only, he died the day after the person he became, okay? So he was the brother of this woman, I think, having a child and he died, he was killed the day after his sister had had a baby, right? And he said in that state he could see in all directions, but he decided to go and visit his sister because he knew that she'd had a baby. And he said he, he leant over the baby, and this was in a regression, and he wanted to touch the baby but didn't, but suddenly just fell in and, and was aware in the cot that he was already, he was in the baby's body. He'd taken it over. And I thought, wow. And there was a lot of proof involved in that too. It's, it, it raises issues because sometimes people say, do you get, and I will get people go into a past life that overlaps with their current life. Yeah. In the end, I suspect there's a, a, what's the best way I can put it? There's a small part of our soul, our spirit, that's in this lifetime and a bigger part that is perhaps in that spirit state. So why not have two lives that are overlapping? I've certainly had patients who will describe in a past life regression and, and a couple of those in the book where they'll describe going into the, into the fetus. One of them didn't want to enter the fetus until about day three or four after the child was born. You, I think you have to keep an open mind to all of these possibilities. But, yes, I've, I've got no doubt that our, there's a small part of us down here, there's a bigger part of us that's up there mm. and that we can have overlapping lives if not all of them actually overlapping given the issues of time so. it, well yes and and if it's all consciousness in the end then we are everything your last book explores the idea that um, we're all one that freaks some people out because they really they really scared of the idea of losing their individuality and their sense of autonomy and that's quite difficult for some people. A Course in Miracles talks about that, that we're all one, we're all part of the same source, the same God, the you name it. And some people freaked out. But my, again, I think we're applying too much of our human logic to that. Why can't we be, as Rumi said, you know, we're all drops in an ocean, in a magnificent and glorious ocean, but within each drop, is that magnificence and the gloriousness of that ocean. So we don't actually necessarily lose ourselves, but we become part of the one. And that's that's the best way I can put it, yeah. And most mystics do get to that concept of oneness. It, really explore it, it actually makes so much sense. And I sort of got there listening uh, to near-death experiences sometimes. You, a lot of people that you hear, they, they say that it's, they're part of everything. They actually get oneness experience and also that it is so simple that a child can understand it. And I thought, well, wisdom has to be simple because it's got to reach everyone. So that made sense to me. One works. Yeah, they in that spirit state, they often talk about the connection, the telepathy, the merging, the expanding yeah. to the, into the universe um, and becoming part of it and yet not actually losing themselves. I just keep a very open mind to that. To all that so. The other thing I was going to ask you is how's Judy going? Judy, look, she's lovely. I can't not see Judy because um, I've been going seeing her for too long and and she's lovely. So at the time I, I wrote the book, she hadn't been in hospital for a number of years. Very briefly, she had, a, she had an appalling childhood, very difficult, very, you know, abused in ways by her brothers it was just terrible and she'd she'd seen psychiatrists before she saw me I ended up seeing her for 20 years trying all sorts of things in and out of hospital ECT 
medications, the whole lot. And but she was a disaster, and she had taken numerous overdoses. She was genuinely lucky to be alive. That that's the truth of it. And she'd had hospitalisation privately, but then subsequently um, publicly. So I wasn't always in control of, of what happened. But either way, after about 20 years, she was still a disaster. And then the regressions just had this just profound effect on her. So how long has it been? So it's been over 10 years now since she's been in hospital. She's still going well. She's getting older. And once you read the book, you'll, you'll understand her body's been through a lot. <laughs> She has bits and pieces happening. She had to have surgery recently, and but that's been successful. It's been fine. So, and there are other things I didn't put in the book that I'm waiting to eventuate that she said would happen, but I didn't put them in because I figured that would be be too much of a spoiler. So um, I'm I'm waiting for those. But she's doing fine, and she still sees her life now with a very different perspective. And as I said in the book, she got to the point because she had all those past lives and the spiritual experiences, she was able to see her abusive brothers in a very different light, was able to forgive them. As I said, she didn't want to have anything to do with them, but she was able to see them very differently and to, and to forgive them, which was quite lovely. So she's doing well. Thanks, Kim. Well, having read the book, you, you kind of get fond of Judy as you're reading the book. I mean, you really are, start rooting for her. Oh, no, no. She's, she is really quite a character. She's, I mean, I think that's what makes the book colourful. And she's this mix of really traumatised and, and have severe depressions and, and self-destructive at times and overdoses, you name it. But at the same time, there is this humour about her, this ability to see things differently. And I put this right at the start of the book just to get people engaged. After the first couple of regressions, she went to lives where she was, I think in America, it was America in the 1800s. She had a couple of lives there. She was a woman. They were really interesting and really helpful, but she wanted to do more. So in the next regression, she went to a life where she was a male, a man in France, who had a family, a wife and two children during the war. So he was hiding people under the floorboards to, to, to save them from the Germans, to protect them. And eventually the Germans came, found out what had happened and came and shot him. And it was very traumatic because he shot the wife and the children as well. They, 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 and it was like, whoa. And she, after I, she was coming out of the hypnosis, I thought, oh, my God, I've traumatised her even more, you know. Man, what am I doing? And all she did was was look at me and say, "John, what the fuck? You didn't tell me I could be male." So she she had just assumed that she was going to be a, a female in every past life. She hadn't even thought about it. And that's the nature of her. She was quite colourful. It's hard not to to get engaged in the story, and it, and it puts you in the room, so you get a get a sense of of what goes on in the psychiatrist room, at least to some extent. Yeah, yeah. No, it's a, it's a very good read. Yeah, I'm glad she's doing well. <laughs> yeah, terrific. Mm. <laughs> I remember that bit, that shock. What the fuck? How it impacts on people varies. Some people it's just the idea that they're, you know, there's more to life. For others it really helps their sense of grief, that there is life after death, that, that life can go on. So their feelings of grief are uh, improved. For others, it's just the idea that you don't have to get it all right in this lifetime, that, that life's hard, but that there's more to us. For others, genuinely, they go back to a past life that really has meaning for them in this life. You know, one man went back to a life where he was a woman in the Middle Ages. She had lost her husband and she had two children to look after and she was poverty stricken, so she had to steal to feed the children. Eventually, the children died. She died, I think, in her late 30s in that past life. And he came out of it at the end of it and he said, oh, my God, what am I worried about? You know, I'm, I'm getting all caught up with my mortgage and, and all of that sort of stuff. And he said, there's no comparison. You know, my life is, is good. It's very So it had a lovely effect in terms of giving him perspective on, on this time. And, and others, it's the same. They, they'll go back to a life that was very different or it helps them to understand. I mean, one, Cassandra went back to a life where she was in England when the Romans uh, came, invaded England. And initially she loved it because they, there was new technology and they were fed better and it was, and it was very appropriate. But then the, the power changed 
and whoever took over the, the reins where she was living or he was living in that life, that became despotic and, and, and cruel and, and harsh. And for her, it was lovely because she's always had an issue, a bit of a paranoia, always been had a bit of conspiracy theory and got anxious about what's going on and, and who's doing what and doing. And so it, whenever she starts talking about now conspiracy theories or people doing this and that, I just say, oh, it sounds like the Romans are, um, are back again. And that it, it's lovely for her because it gives her perspective on, uh, on what's going on. And that's very useful. She's interesting because she's done more reading and she's a bit like us. She would say, look, I know this isn't what's real anyway. This is, in a sense, this is all illusion. There's way more to us. So for people like that, it's very helpful. And for others, it will be sometimes physical. There's Peter wrote about in the book. He went back to a Japanese life where he was a monk and had a temple and it was obviously very important. He may be the closest person to someone famous that I've had because obviously he would arrive in towns and there'd be people lined up to cheer for him and, and welcome him. But in the end, he was in his temple with, with all the monks. And he's interesting too because he said the monks were dressed in black and they wore these funny little hats. And he said, that I'm pretty sure they were monks in that life. That's how it felt. But he said, I've never heard of that. And, of course, he then researched Japanese monks and they do wear black and they sometimes wear funny hats. But he went to, in the temple, they were then attacked and raided and the temple was burnt down. He had wounds, but he died from the, the fire and probably from smoke inhalation. So it was interesting. It was very powerful for him. He said it took him a good 24 hours to kind of ground himself after that after that hypnosis. He wasn't a patient. He was someone I'd done as a favour. And I saw him a year later and he said, John, I don't think you, you realise, but I've had asthma all my life. And ever since we've done that regression, my asthma's gone. So even at a physical level, and I had a similar one, I won't go into <laughs> similar one with a woman who had tonsillitis, and she, after we did the regression, the tonsillitis disappeared. She'd been, went back to a life where she'd been abducted and forced into prostitution. So it wasn't hard to draw the connections between that, but she'd had tonsillitis monthly all her life. Should have had her tonsils out, to be honest. After we did the regression, she described the tonsillitis just disappearing and that's still the case two years later so so lovely so yes it has all of these different layers of, of potential potential benefit yeah wonderful stuff well i could keep talking for another hour but i know we're at the time unfortunately so thank you so much i might reserve you for another talk another time because i feel like it was a really great to hear you talk. I love it. It's really interesting. So thank you for having me on. Oh, my absolute pleasure. Thank you.